All right, welcome to the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment webinar series. Uh, my name is Matt Balhop. I'm the director of the center and also a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Geosystems Engineering, the University of Texas at Austin. To learn more about us, please visit our website, uh, follow us on LinkedIn, and, uh, and uh, see our YouTube videos. Uh, a little bit more about the center. Uh, we are a group of uh, approximately 25 principal investigators and faculty, um, in addition to uh, over 100 graduate students and researchers. The research we do in the center is a variety of subsurface applications, technical disciplines, and engineering tools. We collaborate with industry a lot of different ways. Here are some of our industrial affiliate programs, which is one way we do that. And I like to point out uh, direct or the direct or the digital reservoir characterization technology uh, consortium, which is uh, run by our two speakers today, John Foster and Michael Perch. Uh, our monthly webinars are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. The webinars are hosted on the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams. If you're unable to make it live, then um, all the webinars are uploaded on our YouTube channel. So we encourage you to go visit those for some past webinars. Our upcoming webinars will be Tuesday, September 13th, and it will be by Charlie Worth. Um, and well, actually, I think that that title is inaccurate, but uh, but it will be Charlie Worth next month and in October to be determined. Uh, we ask that you please post your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, the way that today's uh, panel will work is I have a um, I have a series of questions myself that I'll be asking, and it'll be sort of uh, an informal discussion, but you can also post your questions, and uh, if we have time, then we'll try to get to those. So with that, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. So uh, Dr. John Foster is an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering, um, as well as the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics. Uh, he is also a member of the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Uh, he received his bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering from Texas Tech and his PhD from Purdue University. Uh, our other speaker is Dr. Michael Perch, who's also an associate professor in the Department of Petroleum Geosystems Engineering um, and is also involved in the Jackson School of Geosciences. Um, and of course is involved uh, in the Center for Subsurface Energy and Environment. Um, he is the principal investigator of the Energy Analytics Freshman Research Initiative. Uh, and um, as I mentioned before, both him and John uh, co-lead the uh, direct consortium on data analytics. And that's a, a good lead in to uh, our uh, webinar today, which is on energy data scientist um, and a uh, a panel discussion with John and Michael. So I, I have some questions, but did uh, did you want to add anything about yourselves before we get started? It's a, if it's okay, I'll just make a couple of comments first, John. Sure, go um, ahead. Matt, um, thank you for the introduction. I'm actually a mining engineer, and that might be a little bit surprising. But it kind of does make sense that I'm here, and that is mining is where data science all got started with engineering and geoscience. Um, it was all about trying to predict where we could find the ore within the subsurface using methods around geostatistics. And so I was formally trained in the area of geostatistics, and that's what led me down this path to working in data science and now in petroleum engineering and petroleum geosciences. Thanks, Michael. I'll, I'll just add to that with respect to my own background. Um, after, well, I guess before and after receiving my PhD, I worked uh, for seven years total uh, at Sandia National Labs. And when I worked there, I was primarily a code developer writing finite element and finite difference physics based codes that could exploit, you know, the supercomputers that the DOE are, are famous for. Um, and so, you know, I kind of consider myself as trained as a computational scientist, which involves a lot of linear algebra, approximation theory, 
uh, of course, a lot of coding and data structures and uh, high performance computing. And so uh, I guess five or six years ago, I started to kind of take those skills and transition them into data science, which uh, a lot of things overlap. So for example, uh, you know, Michael introduced himself as a, uh, you know, this background in geostatistics and a you know popular interpolation method in geostatistics, of course, is Krieging. Um, well, there's an identical method in, in approximation theory that we, you would just call radial. It's a little more mathematical, but it would be, it'd be called uh, you know uh, radial basis function interpolation with a Gaussian kernel. But from a mathematical perspective, they're identical. And so, kind of my transition in, into data science was actually just a lot of a matter of um, learning the lingo. So. In computational mechanics, we use large-scale linear, you know, numerical solvers, nonlinear solvers, you know, optimization routines, uh, and and so a lot of it was just learning the lingo uh, to come in and start applying the things I knew um, in, in data science. John, I don't know how you're so humble with a mustache like that, <laughs> because everybody need, needs to know here that John is one of the best engineering data scientists I ever met. Yeah, I attribute it all, all to the mustache. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Mike. Well, well, that's great. Uh, let's let's start with some definitions to get on the same page. So, I hear the terms data analytics, machine learning, and data science all used um, many times interchangeably. So, uh, I was wondering if you could define those terms, explain what the differences are, the similarities. Uh, maybe John, we can start with you. No, Michael had his hand up. I, I think he okay. really wants to answer this one, so I'll, right, I'll, have, I'll, I'll add something if I need to. Matt, Matt, I'm sorry. I have a lot of passion around this. Okay. Data analytics, I'm going to say it, is statistics. It's really a bit of a rebranding. Uh, you might say it's more about kind of business analytics, visualization, decision making, but statistics has always been doing that. And so I like to say data analytics is statistics. If you use state statistics at work to support what you do and add value, update your CV. You do you do data analytics. Now, machine learning is all about two, two areas of interest, and that is machine learning for the purpose of inferential modeling to learn about the population from the sample, a limited sample, or prediction. Given what you believe about the population, make predictions of the next sample. And so the, those are the two modes of machine learning that we work in. And data science is all about fourth paradigm way of thinking. That is, we've gone beyond the, you know, experiments, the, the theoretical, the um, building the numerical models based on physics. We're using the data to drive our discovery. And so that's how I see data science. John, I'll turn it over to you. I don't have a lot to add except, uh, you know, often you see the term data scientist. And unless I, when I hear that term, unless I have a, a reason to believe otherwise, I kind of lump in uh, both traditional data analytics and machine learning underneath that category um, because you know st machine learning is also known as statistical inference and and like uh, like Dr. Perch said you know in the past you know we just it's kind of been a rebranding statistics data analytics so I, I think of someone who's a data scientist uh, as someone who does both data analytics and machine learning although uh, I have seen a, a new term pop up in more recent years called a, a machine learning engineer. Uh, of course, I don't know how a machine learning engineer does his job without first doing some data analytics, but uh, nevertheless, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, given the widespread hype around data science and machine learning, in your opinion, are these things required skills now and in the future for petroleum engineers and geoscientists? Uh, John, we'll start with you this time. Sure. Um, yeah, I, in fact, I'm 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 hearing that more and more from from folks at companies. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of certainly the the students who graduate from U UT, uh, if they take Dr. Perch and I's classes, between the two of us, we teach five courses that kind of cover aspects of these areas. Um, so they're well trained when they leave here uh, in data analytics and machine learning, and can you know hopefully uh, use them in their day to day job, uh, much like. Uh, you know, there's an expectation that most engineers would have some capability to use Excel, right? I think, you know, most of our engineers that are graduating now have some capability to, to use uh, a programming language, primary Python, um, and, and be able to do some, use some of the data analytics toolboxes like, num, like NumPy and SciPy and 
um, Matplotlib and pandas and things. We may go over in a little more detail later when we talk about programming languages. But um, so yeah, I, I think it's I think it's already happening. Um, and and I kind of see coding as literacy in the future. I, I think you know all engineers are going to have to have some competency in, in coding uh, in the future. The reality is that the problems we solve now as engineers are just far too complex to to handle on a piece of paper. Most of those problems have been solved already. So. That's my take. And Matt, I would just say, um, welcome to the fourth paradigm of scientific discovery. We can't undo it, we're here now. It's not gonna change back. And so the world is a different place. We're now focused on, and we're we're augmenting our ways to discover things about our natural world around us with data-driven methodologies. And it's all driven by available computational resources, new data streams that are even more dense than the amount of data and big data we have to work with, and really exciting new algorithms and open source developments that are available to us. So I really can't see us going back. I think going forward, as John said, I, it's literacy. We're going to need to be able to, to do this as engineers and geoscientists. Yeah. And um, I, I'd just like to add one thing to all that. Uh, I joined the department in uh, 2007, and I taught computer programming for uh, really about the first 10 years. And early on, the amount of pushback I got from students was um, was almost comical because uh, everybody told me that in their internships and their discussions with family members and friends that nobody in the industry did any programming, everything was by Excel. Um, and then uh, slowly I started to see uh an evolution there um and and after a while i'd have students come back to me and say i was the only person in my job that knew how to do that so i was really valuable and you know my my boss came to me now i'm kind of seeing a, a a new phase where it's a necessity so whereas maybe there was this period where you were special now you absolutely have to be good at those skills, um, you know, or otherwise um, the industry is passing you by. Yeah, to ju just echo what you said, I, I agree. I started as a faculty member in 2011. Um, yeah, there was some pushback early on, but but now the students seem very eager to learn to code. Uh, I teach our sophomores how to program and, you know, the class you used to teach, Matt. Um, and and I think a lot of them, well, some of them even come into that class already having some experience in, in Python. So they're learning it on their own even before they get here. Uh, and they certainly are, are eager to learn it when they're here. And, you know, Michael and I both teach, teach elective classes that, that involve these, uh, you know, Python and other languages. And they're they're typically pretty full for, for elective classes. So I think the students are very eager to learn these things. Yeah. Great. Well, uh... Well, Michael, what are some of the most interesting applications of machine learning you've seen in the last few years? Yeah, so I, I get really excited about what's going on with machine learning. Um, one thing that's really exciting me exciting me is that I'm I'm traditionally trained in the geostats community. I go to the geostats Olympics every four years, geostats Congress, and we've been talking for decades about new ways to model the subsurface. Um, John just talked about Krieging. You know, this idea of having some form of a filter or kernel that can be used in order to uh, make interpolations in the subsurface. We could also talk about, you know, sequential Gaussian simulation. And then we went to object based methodologies and ultimately multiple point simulation. But what we're doing right now with GANs, generative adversarial networks, is just really, really amazing. Is that we're able to actually build very realistic heterogeneity models of the subsurface that are now honoring seismic multi-scale containment of the reservoir, the major boundaries and barriers in ways that we could never do it before. And so I'm really excited about that and what it's teaching us about the subsurface. And if I can throw one more thing in, we have students who are working on multi-scale flow proxy models. And this is exciting because we work with Dr. Pernodovich, uh, people like Dr. Foster, and what we've been doing is you can build these types of models that are taking very small grain, poor scale models, and are actually working out how that affects larger scale reservoir relevant scale flow. And to me, that's the dream, true multi-scale flow in the subsurface. Very exciting. Yeah, for me, I mean, uh, it's kind of two answers to the question. It, it, it seems like every day, Facebook, Meta, uh, 
re releases some some new library that does something that blows my mind, particularly with, with related to natural image processing. I'm sorry, natural language processing, so that you can just like say, type or speak to the computer, and it will generate a very realistic image for you. You know, uh, those things are, are pretty amazing. Uh, but you know, closer to, to things that we do in engineering, um, I've, I've been really focused on a lot of the so-called scientific machine learning applications. So, kind of the marriage of machine learning and and physics-based forward modeling. Um, some of the work that we've done and other people have done uh, is is for the sort of automated discovery of physics. So, you know, the reality is that the, our engineering balance laws really work pretty well. You know, sometimes I joke that all of engineering is just four equations, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, and the second law of thermodynamics. And everything that we do in all of engineering is just kind of a special special case with some assumptions on those equations. Now, the a lot of the assumptions and, and a lot of the work goes into constitutive closure laws, right? Try to uh, the problem is you can't solve those equations without additional equations that are often you know related to the you know the, the particular physics of the problem. And and so there's been some work done recently where say you can embed neur neural networks inside of an engineering balance law, say conservation of momentum, as an unknown constitutive law, and then supply data and train that neural network through the solution of the differential equation. Now, to do these things, you have to use, uh, you know, special libraries where you can basically compute gradients through differential equation solvers. Um, but nevertheless, they exist, and and the work that's coming out now uh, is is really interesting to the extent where I've even seen people do symbolic regression so that. The output of of the neural network is in fact an equation, uh, an equation with with symbols in it, with parameters, um, and and in cases where where we actually know the physics pretty well, um, they can actually recover the known um, constitutive laws symbolically, from you know basically from you know by learning it, and and I think this is a really interesting thing where you know uh, a model is worth a thousand data sets, right? So if we can use these these uh, these techniques to actually learn more physics, then I think that's that's truly interesting. And and then when when we have a when you have that happen, when you when you have some physics in there to constrain the problem, often you can extrapolate quite well. So every most people know that you know neural networks is, uh, do a great job interpolating, but they don't often extrapolate well. But when you have some physics in there, it can it can really go a long ways towards uh, helping with that. So that's that's what I'm most interested in. Matt Matt Johns was so good. Can I have another? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. And, and John, that was really super good. Can I, I want to throw another one in that we've partnered on, that we work together on. And that is when we do geostats, we actually sample, you can show by recursion of Bayes' theorem, that you actually sample from the joint probability density function for the subsurface, all the permeabilities at all locations and so forth. When you do machine learning to build a subsurface model and you build an ensemble of models, there's no guarantee that it's actually a good uncertain model. And so John and I have actually been tackling the problem of how do we tune machine learning models so that you get a good uncertainty distribution given the data, given the various sources of uncertainty. And what I think, John, what, and tell me if I'm getting caught up here in hubris, but I think this is actually going to open a floodgate to machine learning for the prediction uncertainty models in the subsurface, which is more important than accurate prediction is to have a good uncertainty model, I would say. Yeah, that's that's great, and I'll echo that. I, I'm I'm pretty excited about that as well. Uh, uh, so just you know, one, one I had a recent student, uh, PhD student, that just graduated, and he showed that you know we can build machine learning models where the uncertainty distributions basically um, match very well with uh, brute force Monte Carlo. So they they respect the physics, uh, the entire not just not just the prediction itself, but also the uncertainty bounds, the P10, P90. In the lingo of petroleum engineering, so yeah, pretty exciting stuff. Well, that's great. So, uh, what are the most important programming languages for data science and machine learning? Uh, please speak about both how things are now, in your opinion, of the future. And I think we'll start with John here because I I, I know for a fact he's very passionate about uh, different programming languages. Yeah. So I mean. Uh, just to give some background, I've used when I, you know, my first language in, in university was Fortran, probably like Michael's as well, maybe you as well, Matt. And then later on, moved to many engineering languages, um, MATLAB, Mathematica, Maple, MathCAD, used kind of all of those in school for some time. 
um, when I got to Sandia, I was basically a full-time developer in C++. I've written, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of C++. And then in uh, around 2007 is when I, I'm sorry, in around 2011 is when I picked up Python. And, you know, it was, it was fairly quick after I learned Python that most of the other languages faded away. I could, I found that I could do almost everything I was doing in, in the other languages in Python and I could do it much quicker, you know, write code uh, a lot faster. And then of course there's so many libraries, particularly, you know, Python's eating the world of uh, machine learning and data science for sure. There's, there's no way that there's a more popular language right now than, than Python. So you have to, you have to know it. Um, we teach Python to our incoming um, students uh, here uh, and we teach it in, in most of our undergraduate classes that involved uh, any programming. Um, since 2011, I've taught a course called Introduction to High Performance Computing. And since 2011, when teaching that class, up until last year, I taught it in Python. But this last year, I switched that class to Julia because I just had been learning. I've been uh, a casual user of Julia over the years and had gotten uh, as more and more as the language matured and, and eventually became stable uh, five or six years ago. Um, you know, it, it, there's just so many exciting things about that language. Uh, you know, a lot of the selling point is that uh, you get, you know, the kind of C, C++ speed with the ease of syntax of Python or MATLAB because it's a just-in-time compiled language. And so I, now I teach that in my high-performance computing class because I just couldn't have a class called high-performance computing and not teach the high-performance computing language. So I'm really excited about uh, Julia and the future of Julia. I think, I mean, already today, it probably has the best uh, differential equation solver suite in the world. And the exciting thing about that is you can actually automatically differentiate through that. So that application I was talking about earlier of embedding neural networks inside of differential equations and then needing to compute gradients with respect to the unknown parameters of the neural network, that's very difficult to do uh, in Python where you're using, an, you know, if you use the Python, say, SciPy library, the actual code uh, is an old Fortran, you know, the actual differential equation solver is, is an old Fortran code that's been around in the 70s and it's just a small Python wrapper around it. And it's not built in a way right now that you can actually compute gradients through the solution of that thing. So it just won't work uh, in that type of application. Now there, there are other uh, tools out there that are coming along in the Python world too for that kind of thing, uh, built on top of PyTorch and JAX. Uh, neural network libraries uh, that have automatic differentiation capabilities. But Julia essentially has it language wide and that's very exciting. Uh, has a great built in package manager, uh, you know, way to, to distribute your, your code to others and a lot of other things. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Julia. I think I think in 10 years we may be talking about maybe even five years be talking about Julia the way we talk about Python. Um, but, uh, you know, Python definitely has the market share right now. And then one last language I'll just mention is Rust. I know a lot of people uh, like are, are starting to use Rust. It's a compiled language. Uh, some people use Go as well, uh, Google's language. But you know these are these are folks who are kind of moving from C++. They want a little bit more syntax friendly language than uh, C++, uh, but they still want to stay in a compiled language. So uh, you know Rust and Go don't have as many libraries for scientific computing and machine learning that we often need as engineers. So they're a little bit behind the others, but um, you know, for pure data analytics or you know, embedded things, things running in the cloud, uh, you might look to, to those languages as well. Of course, I think Julia can do all of that as well too. So. Matt, I would. Um, I have a lot of similarities too, John. I uh, grew up in Fortran, mostly driven by the fact that the original open source in spatial data analytics and geostats was all written in Fortran. So I extended a lot of things on that open source. GSLib was the library. And then um, I learned C++ in order to do an internship in industry. And I then spent about a decade doing full stack development around reservoir modeling with C++. Now, then, it was it was kind of a little bit near the end of my time in industry that I started to kind of fall in love with Python. And um, what I found with Python, you know, adding on to a lot of John's comments around it, was I coded much less and I got much more done. It, it has that mentality of I'm going to do something, don't reinvent the wheel, don't code it up, try to find the package, import the package and try to use, implement an open source package to get the job done. Now, because I am trained in geostats and uh, data analytics, I need to mention R. 
And and I'm just going to say it, John. I know when it comes to Google Trends, R is kind of losing and Python is winning. But when it comes to code that's very robust, excellent documentation, one-stop shop, you run one command, you get everything, all your diagnostics and so forth. Hadley Wickham and the crew over there have definitely made very safe statistics for everybody to use. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, R is a great language for, for statistics and machine learning. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, one reason to pick a language, I talk about this in my class a lot, is the size of the community, right? And and it's actually why I wouldn't recommend Julia for as a first language right now, even though I think it's ready. I, th I think it, it, you know, it, it, it's as good of a language to learn as Python from, from the quality of language standpoint. It's, it, you know, in, in many ways better, honestly. But the size of the community is still small relative to Python, quite a bit smaller. And so, you know, one reason to pick a language, especially a language to learn, is is the size of the community. And nothing beats that. Uh, R has a good community, but Python is still much, much larger. And and the benefit of that is it's much easier to find help, right? You, you, you know, there's often say that 80% of the production code out there is copied and pasted from Stack Overflow, right? So, you know, to, to be a good coder, uh, you know, even though I've been coding for 20 years now, I still regularly look at every day I'm coding. Uh, I have right next to my terminal, uh, I have uh, Google open and I'm regularly um, looking at documentation and or, you know, searching Stack Overflow or Discourse or uh, on a Slack channel to try to get help or see if something's already been done uh, in some way, right? So. Uh, the size of the community definitely helps when, from the perspective of Python, uh, learning learning a new language, learning a Python. So, Here's the challenge to the people listening to this call. Go to Google now, put a general coding question in, execute it, and the first couple of pages will likely be dominated by Python responses. Yeah. Uh, so uh, before I ask my next question, I just wanted to remind the audience that they can post any questions in the uh, Q&A. So uh, if you do that, we'll try to get to some of those questions uh, by the end of the hour. But uh, I did want to follow up on the last uh, topic, which is how do you choose which language to use for a given task? Uh, Michael, would you like to start with that? Yeah, and, and so Matt, Matthew, this is really interesting is that um, you know, when it comes to tasks, we're educators, right? And so sometimes our, our concern is we need to educate and share new knowledge with students. And so uh, I'll admit, sometimes I'll pick a very simple approach, a very simple language in order to bridge the students from what they know to what they don't know. And so I may make a choice to do that, and that may drive me to start in R. Or I've even had classes where I started a little bit in Excel, and then I showed them immediately what they could have done in Python, say with Pandas. Um, so that's often it's it's based on what is the purpose of what I'm doing. If it's education, I'll be very driven by what the students are ready to to do. Now, when it comes to getting things done, you know, Python pulls me in every time. The number of packages, the maturity of the packages, the documentation on the packages. I want to build a subsurface trend model. And within 15 minutes, I had the trend model done. It was a large, sparse data set. And I used AstroPy, an astrophysics package, because it allowed me to do very fast, sparse data convolution. And I was able to build my trend model. And so there's so many great synergies with the packages. Yeah, great, great answer, Michael. I agree with the student perspective. Um, you know, a lot of times, if, if education is the goal, you know, I look, look to start with Python probably. Um, you know, for my own tasks, uh, there, there again, it, it, it just really depends. If it's an existing project, uh, of course, I just use the language <laughs> that, that the project is, is in. Uh, a lot of my existing projects these days, things I've been working on for years are in Python. I have, you know, one old legacy C++ code that I still maintain um, that, uh, you know, we still write C++ in. But I will say anything new, um, and, and that was a great answer too, I guess, with respect to the packages. You know, sometimes I pick a language just because the library, uh, you know, like for example, scikit-learn in Python is probably the most used machine learning library in the world, even though, you know, R has a great built-in machine learning tool set as well. Um, so a lot of times I pick the language based on the package, but uh, you know, most of the time these days, if I'm starting something new from scratch, uh, I use Julia. So. Great. Uh, 
aside from programming, what other knowledge background do you feel is important for data science and machine learning? So may I jump in? Go ahead. Yeah. The data scientist Venn diagram. Everybody just imagine that in your head right now. What do you got? You got a circle of coding and sometimes they say hacking. You got a circle where they say statistics and modeling. And then you got a circle up top and everybody remember what that circle is? Because if you don't, you don't get to call yourself a data scientist. It's the main expertise. It's the main knowledge. And that's one thing we have to realize. And that's why everybody who's a geoscientist or an engineer on the call, don't drop out of your degree. Keep being awesome geoscientists and engineers. Everything we're talking about is built upon that. And I'll tell you what, from John and I's experience, we can take an engineer or a geoscientist and make them very good at data science based on that domain expertise. And John, can I say it? We run into people who've tried to come the other way at it, mm -hmm. where they come in with kind of focus on the coding and this, maybe the statistics. They can't build the domain expertise in a short period of time. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think it's easier to take someone who's a, a geoscientist or engineer and, and train them up in the skills. The other two areas of the Venn diagram, the, the coding and the math and statistics, I, I think that's easier to add to an engineer because most engineers already have a, a pretty strong math background. So to teach them the math they need, particularly the linear algebra, is pr fairly straightforward often. Um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the those are the things we talked about. But any anybody like my own background is trained as a, as a kind of computational scientist, uh, um, approximation theory, you know, someone who's used to solving PDEs with numerical solvers. It's really just a matter of lingo uh, to, to transition. And uh, there's some great resources out the, on the web. Um, uh, you know, one of my favorite resources is, uh, is free. It's on GitHub. Uh, it's called the Python Data Science Handbook by a guy named Jake Vanderplas. Uh, who works at Google now, um, and and he he does a really high level job, a uh, good job of introducing not you know it, it it's from the perspective of Python, but uh, you know it's just very easy to read, uh, and and introduces the the lingo or the jargon, and a lot of times you'll recognize if you come from a different background that um, you know the mathematical techniques are the same, they're just using different words to describe what's happening. So that's again that's the the Python Data Science Handbook by Jake Vanderplas. Great. So, what about SQL? How important is it for a data science to uh, scientist to to know it? Yeah, I I, I, uh, I helped with this question uh, question because it's one I often get asked, right? Um, and and here I'm going to make a distinguish, uh, you know, a, a delineation between what we often call a data scientist and a data engineer, right? So, <clears throat> a data engineer is often someone who you know, basically spends their whole day doing SQL, right? They <clears throat> they need to think about the the layout and the structure of SQL tables, and you know how, exactly how to design the schema to to get data out in an efficient way. So, you know, I would put that in the realm of data engineering. The the data scientist, I, I would say, is someone who often just takes the data from the data engineer, and then you know begins to to use statistical techniques to to make decisions based on that data. So from, from that kind of perspective and definition, a data scientist, I think most people can get by with very simple SQL queries and uh, you know SQL or SQL structured query language. The, the, the simplest queries are quite easy. I mean, it's just like almost read like English, you know, from a column of data, select some particular particular aspect, right? And then the, the beauty of that is, you know, you can make a lot of these calls right from Python, right? So you don't even have to, you know, use some particular SQL tool. You can you can actually use uh, pandas has a command read SQL where you can just write a, a simple string. Uh, you know, once you're connected to a database, pull in the data, and then you have a pandas data frame. So so my advice is for the data scientist, um, especially those coming from you know engineering geologist background, to just know the kind of bare minimum SQL when you need it. Uh, I wouldn't advise going to take a full course. It'd probably be overkill, something like that. So, um, yeah, I think, you, you know, just kind of the bare minimum SQL commands, get everything into a data frame and then use your Python knowledge to, to manipulate it from there. And if I would just support what John just said, and that is um, for the role of data scientist, 
having a really great expertise around pandas, DAS, working with big data, being able to manipulate the data, be able to do queries. There's there's so much you can do with expert use of pandas. Mm -hmm. And and so and and the result is you get a nice integrated workflow with everything in the same place. And to me, that just kind of simplifies life too. Yeah, that's great. Uh, what do you think the best way to learn and distill the multiple multidisciplinary knowledge required to be a data scientist? So every time I show a matrix scatter plot, um, Dr. Foster says, OK, now we know it's a perch workflow. He's showing some matrix scatter plots now. I, I think data visualization. I think and it's really interesting before I got onto this path of kind of using Python and all this, I don't remember ever sitting there for an hour to build a, a really great visualization. I never did that before. And, and so now what's happening is this whole kind of shift in my brain and the way I do things in this Python world has got me really excited about kind of building up data visualization element by element, composing everything, communicating in a very powerful way, and then being able to export it to any resolution. Hey, you know those journals want 600 dots per inch, right? You can give it to them in exactly that in any format. And so I really do think that powerful data visualization is just critical to be able to share our knowledge, what we're learning from the data. Now, the other thing too is model diagnostics. And this is something that kind of makes me scared when people use more and more complicated models. Uh, the more complicated the model, the less interpretable the model will be. And so being able to use model diagnostics, you know what they call explainable machine learning, XML, is critical. You know, th just things like Shapley value, bring that in and you can use that all the way from information or from game theory, I should say, cooperative game theory, to be able to communicate what the model's doing and how the model's sensitive to the inputs. Now, I think all of those things are critical, um, as, along with also, and this is a neat thing about Jupyter, working with Jupyter Notebooks and Colab, is that you have blocks where you can put in text, equations, explanations, you can have well-documented workflows, prototype workflows, and you can actually try to deal with all that metadata. Uh, you know, you generate almost as much metadata, really. It's like, how do you make those decisions? How do you support your interpretations every step of the way? Well, all of that can be put into your workflows when you're working in these environments. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll be a little more specific since Michael gave kind of a some broader uh, topical answers. I'll be a little more specific on this, um, you know, to, to how to learn it. So for, first of all, like we already talked about, I, I think the correct approach is to take someone who has data domain expertise, and I suspect that's most of the people on the call today, right? Geoscientists, engineers, and and skill you know upskill them and and a little bit more math and statistics if they need that plus the coding right so well how do you learn to code well if you don't know how to learn to code at all uh, there's a lot of you know web-based tools that like code academy uh, that there's one called data camp those are all all good lots of free resources um, if you do know how to code say in another language uh, say say you know how to use matlab and you're interested in learning python the best way is, is to take some project that you already solved in say MATLAB, uh, maybe even an old school homework problem or something, and just set out to do it in Python and learn you know, line by line sort of how to translate that code. Because if you've already written it, I assume you understand the structure of the code and it's more of it's just a syntax issue. So I think you know when I learned, when I learned Python, now of course I had been coding for a number of years by that time and had exposure to several different languages. I mean, I, I was fairly proficient in Python in just a matter of two or three weeks. Um, and and uh, so and of course the more languages you learn there, there's similarities in, in a lot of things and you can pick up things uh, there's a, I've, I've found a lot of similarities between learning new programming languages and learning to new spoken languages uh, you know the, the more you know the, the the easier it is to pick up new ones because there, there's a lot of similarities um, in in the structures of the different languages and syntax patterns and other things like that um, you know to, to I already mentioned like you know to learn the lingo and, and some more of the details the, there's a great resource the python data science handbook another great resource is actually the scikit-learn documentation so uh, i mentioned earlier scikit-learn is a python library that's probably the most used machine learning library in the world uh, and it has a great documentation and so 
you can actually go and learn quite a bit about each of the estimators, right? So when I say estimators, I'm talking about you know statistical estimators. So linear regression would be one, support vector machines, neural networks, all of those things. There's a fair amount of information in the documentation of Scikit-Learn about what each of those do, um, as well as there's really good tutorials. And so I think you know a great first way and often instruct my graduate students who are interested in learning, you know, some more about machine learning to just look at the scikit-learn tutorials and work through them. Uh, you can learn quite a bit, quite a bit that way as well. Uh, I think, I think I'll stop there. Yeah. John, I, I, if I can add to what you've been saying, yeah. it's like what we tell our students. It's going to take you three or more times longer to do it the first time in Python or a new language, but you're going to learn something new. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, so I have a question that I think everybody wants to know the answer to, which is what role does Microsoft Excel play in data science? And should I have, be to let, out? I have to let Michael answer that one because I haven't opened Excel in years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I being facetious. I, 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 I open it, but only to look at when someone sends me something to look at. I, then I often uh, read it right into a pandas data frame and go on about my business. So, so I'm going to read Dr. Foster's mind and give his answer. John, you let me know if I got this right, okay? Okay. Excel is a spreadsheet. Use it to do the activities that you would, that require a spreadsheet. Don't use it to do data science. Don't use it to do st statistics. Everybody knows Excel can't even make a proper histogram, right? Like there's, there's, you know, the random number generator wasn't working for a long time. Like there's all kinds of issues in Excel, right? Okay, so, and oh boy, if there's somebody here on the line from Microsoft, I, I apologize. Maybe that was a little bit rude and please still fund my research. Okay, so sorry. But mm -hmm. anyway, but uh, but don't use it for your data science platform. It was never intended to, intended to do that. John, did I get that right? Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, the other the other issue is just from a code quality perspective. It's very difficult to read, you know, anything more than just like a simple sort of algebraic tasks between columns. It's very difficult to read compl complicated formulas in Excel. And so, you know, part of software quality is is readability, maintainability, and other things like that. Uh, the ability to test your code, um, all of all of that is uh, a lot more difficult in in uh, Excel and. I mean, quite frankly, I, I can just in, in almost every application, I could write the Python code to do a, the same task in, in Python pandas versus Excel in, in less time. And, and it'll be scalable to much bigger data sets, right? I mean, you can't even open an Excel spreadsheet that has a few million lines of data, but pandas, pandas can handle that without issue. John actually teaches, you teach a short course to assist the Excel addicts to get off their addiction, don't you, John? Yeah, I teach a one-day course called uh, Python for Excel Addicts, where we take a common reservoir engineering workflow. Probably most reservoir engineers have some type of well economics workflow, probably sitting on their desktop that they use all the time. They take the, you know, output of a type curve and then compute the economics uh, to, to to see, you know, to make decisions about the future of that well. And we, you know, so I teach a course where we take a workflow like that that that's in Python. I mean, uh, in Excel. And we show how to convert it into pandas, uh, Python library, uh, but not just convert it one to one, but then to take it further and see, you know, how you can sort of automate a lot of the tasks and, um, you know, just make a higher quality product. And uh, I guess I should have mentioned that uh, when I was talking about how to learn uh, data science, I, I didn't even plug ourselves, right? So Michael and I actually do quite a bit of training. Um, we teach everything from one day short courses to full programs. Uh, multiple multiple weeks of courses that uh, you would take over some time to to basically train you up to be a data scientist. So if you're interested in that, you're welcome to contact us about that too. We taught 1,700 working professionals. Was that the year before last, John? 2020, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, what do you view, view the role of engineering and geoscience domain knowledge? And are we replacing the engineer or geoscientist? I know. So, John, can I jump in? I have a lot of passion of on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I tell people, and I, I sincerely believe this, is that we will use these advanced methodologies to do a better job understanding our complicated big data, to be able to automate the tasks, the common, the mundane tasks that we perform, 
And the whole goal ultimately is for engineers to do more engineering, geoscientists to do more geoscience, and people to have less repetitive stress injuries. Like I really want to see, you know, us being able to focus on using our domain expertise. Now, the good thing is this. We've heard many cases of people coming in trying to apply these methodologies without domain knowledge, and invariably it leads to a very good train wreck story. So we are both we're confident that we are not replacing engineers and geoscientists. Yeah, I have an example I always show in just a very simple scikit learn workflow, um, where if you, you you take some porosity permeability data and, and you know tr try to fit a machine learning model to it. And if you do things naively, it will happily spit out negative permeabilities, right? Um, and so this was, you know, the comment Dr. Persh made earlier is like, you know, if you have someone who say a computer science or data scientist and you try to upskill them in domain knowledge, that's a lot more difficult than to take somebody with domain knowledge and do the other thing. And if you have the domain knowledge, it's quite easy to just add some simple constraints or to formulate the problem in a way that you won't have negative permeabilities, right? And if you if you do that, that same workflow that I was talking about that I often use as an example to my classes, um, you, you actually can get quite good predictions by just simply constraining the permeability to be positive. Then with the same data set, you can get predictions that will outperform the typical kozini karman models and other things. So, but, it, but if you do things naively, it, it will happily spit out negative permeabilities. <laughs> so, uh... Your comments remind me of the movie Armageddon when they argue, argue about whether they should be turning drillers into astronauts or astronauts into drillers. <laughs> um, they turn they turn medical doctors and all the kind of other uh, engineers and scientists into astronauts all the time. I don't see. I think it'd be easier to, to <laughs> turn a driller into an astronaut. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I have a question particularly for uh, Dr. Foster. So uh, we hear a lot about open source. Mm -hmm. uh, can you comment on the, the importance of open source? Yeah, this is something that I believe in so much that, uh, you know, when, when we do teach our short courses, I have a whole section, you know, probably 15 or 20 minutes I dedicate to this because for those that are uninitiated, they, they might believe is, you know, because it's free and freely available that the quality might be low. Um, but what, in my experience, the, the, the actual, the opposite is true. In, in the, in the well-used libraries, libraries like Scikit-Learn, uh, the quality is quite high, and it's quite high for a multitude of reasons. One is just there's a lot more eyeballs looking, looking at it, right? Um, Linus, Linus Torvald had a quote, I can't remember, it's something that, if the community is large enough, all bugs are shallow, which means that, you know, it's easy to, you know, if enough people are looking at it, all bugs will get found. But that alone is it's not just the number of people, it's, it's the software infrastructure that is built up around the open source community because the community is large. Uh, you know, if you're maintaining the scikit-learn, you, you may get, I don't know, 100 pull requests a week, meaning like 100 feature enhancements or improvements to the code. That's a lot for one person to go through and take a look at what was changed and see if it makes sense and see if the code is well written and is it gonna be maintainable and. It, and um, uh, is it written in a style that everyone can, that it looks uniform with the rest of the code base? And so there's a lot of decisions to be made. And it turns out that in almost to answer all those questions, there are open source tools out there to help you uh, check the quality of your code to, to help, uh, you know, there's something we often use in, in software engineering called unit tests, which basically are automated ways to test the functionality of the code that get run. Uh, automatically upon any addition or subtraction from the code base. And so it's all this tooling that is built up to maintain these large projects that are that are you know maintained by thousands of people. All of that uh, up the the software quality to an extent that it's often much higher than a lot of the closed source, you know, very tightly controlled software that I've seen out there. And so uh, you know, I'm a firm believer in open source. Uh, my, my students, particularly my graduate students, we often try to, to contribute to open source uh, as we can. A lot of that is just um, for, for a way to, to kind of build up the student's resume. I often, often tell people that, you're, you know, if you're a coder, your, your resume uh, is your GitHub profile. You know, it's, it's the projects you've contributed to, your own projects. Uh, you know, that, that's how people are going to assess your, your how how you work uh, your quality of work in, in with respect to coding and so 
Um, I'm a big fan, big fan of open source and contributing to open source when you can. And when you're get, getting started, those, you know, I know it can be kind of a daunting task. Um, but, you know, I often say you can do something as simple as fixing typos and documentation. You know, they're, they're, even the documentation for a lot of these projects itself is open source. And so if you find, if you find typos or bugs in the documentation, uh, you can go through the process often on GitHub of like say submitting a pull request, which is uh, you know just a, the terminology we use for accepting an addition uh, to your code base um, for but for you know typos in the documentation. And that, that's a great way to get started with open source. And then of course as you build up competency, you can begin to do more and more meaningful things. Yeah. A standing invite to anybody on the line to contribute to Geostat Pi open source for geostatistics and spatial data analytics in Python. I, uh, I have a couple more questions, but I just want to remind the audience again that they can post their questions in the Q&A and, and we'll try to get to those in a few minutes. Uh, but before doing that, uh, I wanted to ask if there are any pitfalls in the current common use of data science and petroleum engineering and geoscience. Um, so, you know, are, are we getting something wrong? So a couple of thoughts around that. Uh, have, you, have you ever heard the old adage that 90% of the work on a project is data preparation? My opinion is that that remains. And if anything, I've seen kind of a rush to model. People get a data set, they're excited, they got scikit-learn, as Dr. Foster was talking about, and they're excited to start trying to build predictive models without the proper, the appropriate amount of time trying to learn about the data, trying to make inferences about the popula the data, learn about the patterns and data and so forth. The other thing is, how many times have you seen a model result prediction and somebody has an R squared of 0 0.99999 or something like that? I think there's major issues with overfitting. The more complicated the model, the easier it is to overfit the model, the overfit the data. And if you've got noise in the data, what does that mean? You're overfitting data idiosyncrasies, the noise in the data. That's not a useful model. It will not generalize and predict away from the data. And so I think we need to think more about how we test. We train and tune our model complexity to get fair models. And I think that's a real important aspect. I, I couldn't agree with the second point more. That was going to be my thought. I think most, probably most neural networks. So the, the pitfall is that most people's, uh, you know, eagerness to jump right to neural networks. Uh, you know, these really parameter-rich models. Um, I, I would, I would venture to say that most neural networks are overfit and, and don't extrapolate well outside of the data they were trained on. Um, you know, to stand on a philosophical soapbox for a minute, it. It, it really kind of even violates the progression of science in a way, like uh, if you're familiar with the concept of Occam's razor, right? So amongst competing models, the, the correct one to choose was always the simplest. And, and the reason for that is that we often talk about models being valid, right? But we actually almost never validate a model. When we say a model is valid, what we actually mean is that it's not invalid, meaning all the things we tried to invalidate it or falsify it didn't work. Therefore, among these applications, our model is valid, right? But what we're really saying is it's not valid. We couldn't find a use case where it didn't work, right? But certainly there are more use cases than we can think of, right? And the reason that, that you should always start with simpler models like linear regression, polynomial regression, and build up complexity from there is because there's it, they're easier to falsify. Right, so you should basically start with the simpler models and add complexity until you can't falsify them. And then to go back, like Dr. Perch was saying, they'll be more interpretable. Uh, they're, of course, easier to falsify, right? And, and therefore, you have some more trust when you finally arrive at the model that with the correct amount of complexity, right? Um, the, other, the other thing, I don't know necessarily a pitfall, but something I see particularly among engineering management there's a lot of eagerness to upskill their workforce and add data science teams and and all of these things. Um, and and while I'm I'm not, uh, you know, I don't want to short sell any of that ambition. I think that's that we should be driving towards that. I think most of your early gains as you as you build a workforce uh, full of of you know people who code well is it, it's not going to be deploying massively parallel machine learning. You know 
deep learning architectures in the cloud that help you make decisions. That that's probably not where you're going to see any gains for several years, although you can eventually. Um, I think the gains are actually to be found in just automating boring stuff. You know, a lot of us spend a lot of our days doing things that are repetitive that could easily be automated away. And 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 you know, most people with the kind of data science skill set can can do those things easily. And so I think there's gains a lot of gains to be had. Um, you know, and just in just improving small things across the workforce. Uh, so so I think you know the the rush to neural networks and and the rush to like you know deploy machine learning in your company. Those two things uh, I would say are, are kind of pitfalls, if you will. So uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to answer some of the questions in the Q and A. Um, I, I did get a message that said that. Uh, the Q&A wasn't working. I think the chat is shut off, but the Q&A should be, and we've received a couple questions, so. Um, Can I grab one, Matt? Sure. I saw one from Katie Ute, maybe, that I want to answer. It's, um, do you have any advice for making the transition from being a student where there's a right answer to being a professional where there's nothing to check against, learning to trust output and find capital T truth? What a great question. And, and you're right, when we when we leave the classroom, it's not so simple. We have noisy, ugly data. We have very complicated physics. We have a lot of very massively multivariate spatial temporal data sets to work with and try to make heads and tails out of it. What I'd say is this, is I think that we need to have good training for our models. And so regardless, if you're gonna be working with real data, use very good training data to inform your models. And I think when we build those training models, we need to think about using the, all of the physics, using all of our knowledge, using all the possible data to inform those training models. And so that greatly improves the prediction accuracy of our models. The other thing is that when we're working with data sets and you know, John's been, Dr. Foster been hitting on this a few times, consistency between the data and the physics. If you've got data sets and it's got negative permeability, well, guess what? Garbage in, garbage out. If you've got issues in the data up front, you're going to have issues in the model that you train. In fact, I had a student that showed if you have bias in the data, you'll actually train the bias into the model. And even when you test with unbiased data, the bias remains. And so we've got to be really careful of what we train these models and that we can have control over. Yeah, great, great answer to that question. Also, just add, you know, with respect, I mentioned unit testing earlier. So, you know, even if even if your real problem involves messy, complicated data, you can often, you know, when you write your code, you, you can train it or test it against simple, perhaps even synthetic data that you generated to see if it, you know, can reproduce the, the, the parameter set that you that you input to generate the data or something like that. And when you do those things, you, you should, you know, there's formal ways to sort of engineer that into your software so that you can automate the testing of that. So that, you know, if, if you're going through all that process of, of checking your code, you might as well automate it so that it's always checked. So that as you go on and you add complexity and add other things, uh, those unit tests will run and check check your code against uh, simple answers and stuff. So I think the, the, all of those things are ways to imp improve the confidence, uh, you know, and, and wor to work on problems that don't have answers. Right? And, and one more, if I may. When we test our models, you got to test them in a fair way. And what does that mean? Don't use Scikit-Learn's built-in train test split. No, don't do that because what it'll do is it'll just withhold data that along a well log in a geologic uh, reservoir setting will mean that you typically only have to make predictions about half a foot vertically from where you have available training data. You have to, if the purpose of the model is to make predictions pre-drill at a new well location, you have to with, withhold entire wells. That's fair train test split. Okay. Um, so, oh, John, hey, Matt, can we grab another one? Yeah, absolutely. We've okay, we, we we got go. time, we can go over. Okay, okay, I'll read this one out. Um, the, let's see, it is Gil. Thank you very much for the question. What is the best strategy to overcome management skepticism and resistance to implement machine learning into the subsurface world? Michael, I'll let you answer that one. You have a lot more experience with 
industry managers than I have. So. Okay, okay. And so um, I did come from industry. I had 13 years working for Chevron's technology company. I really enjoyed my time inside of Chevron. And I'll tell you one thing. I learned about how to communicate technology and how to assess performance and to communicate that to my managers. And I, I got to tell you this. If you don't understand the model, it's not going to be implemented. We have high value decisions in our field. And if the if people around you can't understand what you're doing, they won't be able to use it because they can't defend the decisions that are going to be made. OK, so that's the first thing is you have to make sure that your managers are seeing tools and methodologies that they can understand. Now, you know, let's not talk down to managers, right? Dr. Foster and I actually teach a half day course which is machine learning introduction for managers. And remember that time, John, we ran that course, not a single manager left the room. We had the whole leadership team, not a single one left to check their phone. It was just a really great experience and they were asking great questions. We were teaching them about the concepts. We were teaching them about the um, general workflows and methodologies and how to critically review the products of machine learning. So think about it as an opportunity to educate your managers. Um, so, uh, I'm really interested in, in Halen's question here. Um, do you think machine learning based proxy flow models can one day replace reservoir simulators? And, and I hope the answer is no, because my book on the subject is coming out next month. And hey, hey, hey <laughs> plug the book. <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Balhoff on your book. Yeah. I've actually been working on quite a bit of research in this area for the last couple of years and as things stand right now, the answer is is no, not anytime soon. I mean, often a, a lot of what we try to do is to build machine learning proxies or surrogates, um, and then we compare it against the known result from the reservoir simulator. And, it, and in almost every case I've encountered, even when embedding physics, like ph so-called physics-informed neural networks is one area where we've, we've done a lot of this type of work. So the idea there is that you, uh, into the loss function, you not only have your MSC or mean squared error mismatch with the data and the prediction, but you also embed some physical constraint, which is often the, the engineering balance law. So for like single phase flow that a reservoir simulator would compute, you, you just put the equation in there uh, and, and drive the, the residual of the total loss to zero through some optimization process. And in almost every case that I've experienced, um, even even training on GPUs and whatever, the, you know, most of the optimizers are first order. Uh, they just can't compete with the second order convergence that we can get from numerical solvers, um, uh, you know, in traditional forward physics based simulation right now. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, recovering the same accuracy, it takes much, much longer. You often hear you often hear people that work in this. There's a little bit of dishonesty and say, well, my forward prediction only took 0.1 seconds and your reservoir simulator took five minutes, but they never include the cost of training. Uh, it's the cost of training that I'm actually talking about because that same problem might have taken 20 minutes to train the model. Of course, then once the model is trained, then it's just a forward functional evaluation and it takes 0.1 seconds, but you really have to amateurize the cost of training over the number of forward position predictions to, to make a comparison with a forward physics based simulator. That's for forward problems, you know, getting an, an individual answer. Um, however, I think for inverse problems and and for uh, uns problems with uncertainty, I, I think there is some hope um, in using machine learning proxies. Um, we mentioned earlier with, you know, we've been developing models that can represent the, the, the same types of uncertainty. So, for example, if I let's say I have a reservoir simulator and I'm and I want to investigate the effect of unknown an, an unknown permeability or a permeability distribution on the output, right? This the the gold standard for that would be to use Monte Carlo or Latin hypercube sampling and just say run the forward problem with 500 permeabilities plugged from that distribution to get my distribution of outputs, right? And so your your cost to get that uncertainty bound is 500 X, right? 500 times the cost of one forward simulation. We've actually been able to uh, get, you know, neural network surrogates that can reproduce the uncertainty bounds of a forward problem, but but in but in not in like 500 X uh, of training for for one solution. It's it's just like maybe 1.5 of training, 1.5 times the amount that it takes to train for one solution. So. 
uh, I, I think there is some hope for for uncertainty quantification and for inverse problems in in using neural networks or you know machine learning surrogates to replace flow simulation. But for forward problems, not right now. We're we're a ways away from that. So so maybe we'll we'll do one or two more questions, but we are after one. So for those of you that have to leave, I just want to remind you that this webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, same with those of you that may have joined late. Um, so please view that. It'll be up in a couple days. Please share with your colleagues. Uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, lots of lots of good webinars over there. I think about 25 uh, because we've been doing this for a uh, couple of years now. But uh, uh, Pedro has a good question, which I think I know the answer to, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, is a PhD required to be a successful data scientist? You want me to take that, Dr. Foster? Go, go for it. I'll see if I have any. OK, I'll, I'll ask you this. What do you love to do? Like what fascinates you? What keeps you up at night? What gets you really excited? What what draws you in and you can't drop it? If that's data science, then you're good. Just there are so many resources that Dr. Foster was talking about where we can learn, be self-taught. There's formal courses we can take. We do teach those courses, but there's so many ways that we can learn this. If you're a great engineer and your engineering job required a PhD, and then you spend the time to add data science on top, you're going to do a great job with that. If you're an engineer and your job needs a master's or bachelor's or you're a geoscientist and you're good with a master's, you're good there. I don't think you need to specifically get a PhD to be a data scientist. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I think if you if your interest is in developing new machine learning estimators applied to problems that, you know, in petroleum and geoscience, then you should come do a PhD with us. But outside of that, yeah, I mean, if it, you know, you, you certainly don't need um, that level of, of schooling or education to to do the to perform the tasks of a data scientist. In fact, I would I would probably say most data scientists aren't don't have a PhD. The vast majority. Okay, so uh, is there anything anything we didn't touch on? Anything we missed that you'd like to have a few final words about? So it, I would just share a couple of words of encouragement and confidence. Remember, if you're listening to this call, there's a good chance that you already work in the subsurface, either as an engineer or geoscientist. Remember, we in the subsurface are the original data scientists. We've already been dealing with data issues around large, vast, big data sets, having to integrate data together to support very valuable decisions. I bet you'd be surprised if you did a little bit of a check uh, investigation of what you've been doing in the last year, there's probably many things you've done that kind of get into the statistical model, the data-driven workflows. And so just continue on that path. You're doing a great job. Yeah, my, my, I talked a lot about coding today. So my, I, there's one thing I didn't touch on a lot there, and that's with respect to, to software engineering. So, you know, I, I think a lot of us, when we first learned to code, just learned to get the program to spit out a result we want, right? But um, you know, most data scientists, as they get more work on more and more complicated problems, will eventually pick up some software engineering skills along the way, like version control, like using Git and GitHub to maintain your software. That'll save you a lot of time and effort, and allow you to recover, you know, your code when when you write write bugs into your code and you want to go back to the way it was. And so, using version control, um, you know, using unit testing, like I mentioned earlier, to you know. Uh, I often in, in my three, uh, well, in my introduction to programming class, you know, in teaching students to program, I, I teach them to, you know, basically break their code down into, you know, use the single responsibility principle, right? So write a lot of functions, and every function should have one well-defined responsibility. It takes these inputs and it spits out a certain output. And if you write your code in that way, well, then of course it's easy to write code that tests your code, right? You can have a code that calls your function with these particular inputs and you know the output should be you know, 22.3 and so you can write code that tests that right and then you can automate the process of, of that testing and what this does for you it, it may sound like a lot more work but what it actually does is it makes debugging a lot easier because you debug by sort of uh, uh, you, you know if, if you have 50 functions and 49 of them have unit tests that are passing well I can I can without even looking at your code I can tell you exactly which function 
the problem is in, right? Because you you have automated tests, so you you can debug by a process of elimination essentially, and that really vastly cuts down your debugging process. And so, the the sooner you get into coding, the sooner you can learn some software engineering skills. It will make you a much better programmer. It will actually make you more productive in the long run because you'll spend a lot more less time kind of fooling with debugging and 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 just trying to fix. Well, my my you know even environment issues. Well, it, it ran on. Joe's computer, but it's not running on mine. Why is that? And you know, a lot of times you get into the you know dependency issues, and there's ways within the software engineering tool set to, to basically handle all of that. So the sooner you learn some software engineering to go with your coding skills, the, the better. They they complement each other, and it's you know it's a it's part of a complete data scientist toolbox, in my opinion. Okay, well, I think uh, with that, we're going to close up here. Uh, just a, a final reminder that we will post this webinar probably in a couple days onto our YouTube channel. So please go rewatch it or share it with your colleagues. Um, and, and please do go maybe watch some of our, uh, our old webinars. But um, I want to thank our speakers again, John and Michael, uh, you know, just uh, a wealth of knowledge and, and I know that this is such a popular topic. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks, thank you, Matt. Yep. Bye everyone.